Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. To be in art, in the now, at Pacific School of Religion is not just any context or venue to experience interconnections between spirituality and social transformation. Since the inception of the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley in the 1960s, the interdisciplinary teaching of religion of all kinds, in dialogue with the arts in all their varieties, has been a flagship program of the GTU. The GTU's art and religion area, a home for graduate students with backgrounds in art history, literature, theology, religious studies, music history, and sacred dance, to name but several, is one of the few programs in the world where one can study at the graduate level a sustained curriculum in religion and the arts. The others being, as some of you might know, the University of Chicago's Religion and Literature Program and the Theology and Arts Program at St. Andrews in Edinburgh, Scotland. And here in Berkeley, we clearly have the better weather. <laughs> at Pacific School of Religion, which is for over 112 years, the arts have been particularly important and valued, and I would argue connected to social change and social transformations for a very long time, even before Pacific School of Religion became a founding member of the GTU in the 1960s. On the second floor of the Holbrook building, the large stone edifice behind us, behind you rather, in front of me, on the second floor, hangs a large painting of a grove of live oaks, live California oaks, by the landscape painter William Keith. Keith was a very close, a bestie, of Pacific School of Religion's professor of biblical archaeology, William Bade, and Bade had this painting willed to PSR after his death. It reputedly shows a grove of live oaks somewhere around this hilly area we fondly call Holy Hill, where the GTU grew and came together in the later decades, before this part of Berkeley became fully developed. The painting might look large and a little staid, perhaps even boring and bland by our modern tastes, but if we push on it, metaphorically, we are taken to a moment where a group of radical conservationists and preservationists banded together to form the Sierra Club, an organization that began in the informal conversations held in the painting studio of William Keith as they looked at the beautiful canvases of the Sierra Nevada that he had painted in situ. PSR professor Bade actively testified before Congress as a public intellectual against the damning of Hetch Hetchy Valley, enlisted by his friend, the conservationist John Muir. Alongside Bade's testimony, around the same time that Keith made this painting of oak trees on Holy Hill that now hangs in the Holbrook building, William Keith made a whole series of paintings of Hetch Hetchy Valley, which were exhibited before Congress. Visual testimony to the capacious beauty about to be destroyed by the damning project. A kind of visual accompaniment, if you will, to the words that were spoken by Bade, Muir, and others. In Pacific School of Religion's history, this is a moment where the teaching of theology and religion intersected with aesthetics and arts to try and do progressive social work, to engage with the public sphere and stop the destruction of a beautiful location in nature. As many of you know, this advocacy effort failed, and the Hetch Hetchy Valley was subsequently flooded after the Raker Act of 1913 a loss that hastened John Muir's passage into the grave, the fight being so dear and precious to him and his conservation efforts. Well, we could look at this and see a failure of the arts, a spirituality of the wilderness and the wild that did not affect positive social change and social transformation. On the other hand, the beauty of William Keith's canvases of this valley still speak to us in the present and in their beauty even hold out feelings and experiences of hope. Later professors at Pacific School of Religion, such as the late Doug Adams, who I'm sure many in this room once upon a time had. This is not the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 
Adams. The Doug Adams who was known for his red clown noses, his love of Napa and Sonoma wine, and his genius for connecting theology to the arts. Since Doug Adams, PSR has had a deep tradition of creating connections for our divinity students in the classroom who were trying to make a difference out there in the world with the arts in the work they did. Our Masters of Divinity program is somewhat unusual in the theological landscape of the U.S. in that we require our students to take a particular course on religion and the arts that exposes them to the breadth and complexity of how the arts have related to various questions of spirituality and religion. Related to this curriculum, as Lori Eisenberg has just mentioned, for the last two weeks, I have had the great pleasure of co-leading and co-teaching with PSR's Professor of the Arts, Rosita Schroeder, an intensive immersion into the Bay Area art scene, exploring the 12 graduate students who are sprinkled around this room today, from PSR and the GTU, various places where questions of spirituality have cut into social transformation. We spent time in sacred spaces, a synagogue, wondered at the profusion of social justice street art in the streets outside of the Mission Dolores. More recently, we spent an evening on a night tour at Alcatraz Island, immersed in the artwork of the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei that provokes meditations on human rights and the conflicted layers of history and space on Alcatraz Island. And if we could sweep away the wall of the chapel right here and the buildings behind it, we would be able to look down at Alcatraz from this vantage point on the Holy Hill and think of Wei Wei and his site-specific dragon kites, sound installations, the Lego portraits of prisoners of conscience. Though Wei Wei is no longer under house arrest or detention for his work, the Chinese authorities have still revoked his passport, leaving him more or less bound to Chinese soil. And this show of his in a prison is a profound meditation on the power of the aesthetic, the transformative connecting beauty of the arts to transcend dire political context, to go beyond the bars. What is charged and powerful about the Wei Wei show we found as a group of students and teachers was not just its indictment of human rights violations elsewhere in China, Israel, Lebanon, and so on, but the way it made visible the tortured, hidden history of American incarceration, the dynamics of our own ever-growing prison industrial complex. As grim and sobering as all this was, the show was inescapably, exuberantly beautiful in the colorful dragon kite that coiled around the opening room that had for its eyes two birds with the Twitter logo emblazoned on their pupils. <laughs> Signs for the ways in which that social media, such as Twitter, have revolutionized both the democratic potential for freeing and disseminating ideas and thought, but also for the reproduction of images and artworks. As Wei Wei's constant microblogging and picture taking, his middle finger selfies of him giving the universal sign of disrespect to institutions of state power remind us we are indeed living into an age of the image. Some of the images we took as a class of the Wei Wei show became subsequently picked up by his own Twitter feed that often recycles content from the Alcatraz show, recycled and represented there. However, lest we think that the power of images and their reproducibility, their power to sway and affect viewers and transform through transcendence of one sort or another is anything new for our era of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I am so delighted that we are beginning our oral lectures, our investigations of visuality, spirituality, and social change with this morning's lecture by Dr. Rosita Schroeder. Professor Schroeder's talk and the accompanying exhibition across the way in the Doug Adams Gallery at the Center for Arts, Religion, and Education shows how very early on within the Eastern tradition of Orthodox Christianity, a practice emerged of representation that thought through carefully and theorized the power of the image to sway minds and a culture of believers. After we hear Dr. Schroeder's talk 
and spend time immersed in the beautiful icons from the collection of the GTU's Orthodox Institute, we might even find a little hubris in thinking that our age, our time alone, is somehow unique with its preoccupation with what one scholar has called the visual frenzy of modernity.